This morning, we're continuing our series, Looking for Hope. We're continuing our series, Looking for Hope, because we know a lot of people are looking for hope this Christmas. Uh, there's a lot of things that have been going on for the past couple of years, and it's, I mean, it's just crazy. And it could sometimes feel like the world is dark, and there's things, how, what do we have to look forward to? And hope this Christmas isn't going to be found in better Christmas lights or Christmas parties or all the gifts you get. Hope is found in one place. Hope is found in Jesus. And throughout this series, we're looking at four stories of four people who had a look to Jesus. And when they found Jesus, they found hope. I'm excited to share this story with you today. But before we get into this story, I want to tell you the title of my message and then kind of talk a few minutes about it. The title of my message this morning is this, Overcoming Labels. Overcoming labels. Now, I had a couple labels when I was growing up. One of the labels when I was a real little boy, my brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters used to call me PN. It was short for picker nose. Now, I don't have to go into detail how I got that uh, nickname, uh, but they called me that. That was a label I had. I was always bigger than everybody growing up, and I was huge. Sometimes I was bigger than my teachers, and uh, I was growing into my body, and so I got a lot of labels. Clumsy, goofy, slow, and I had labels in my life. I had all sorts of labels. labels. I'm sure you've had some labels. You might still have some labels that are kind of stuck on you. But today, I believe in my heart, and I've been very excited about this message, because I believe today is the day that we could overcome these labels and accept something better that Jesus has for us. And so first I want to start off by describing what a label is. I think this is kind of interesting. The dictionary has two definitions of labels, and I want to look at them both. The first definition of label you'll find in the dictionary is this, a small piece of paper, fabric, or plastic attached to an object giving information about it. Let me tell you about this kind of label. We're familiar with these labels. The best story I could think of is when I bought my first pair of Oakley sunglasses. I knew a girl. She was the manager of the Oakley store, and she told me, Jonathan, you come to the store and you pay with cash, I'll give you 70% discount. So I'm thinking, 70% discount? These are like practically free. Like, I'm, I cannot wait to get my Oakleys. And so I went there, I paid cash, and I grossly overpaid still, uh, paying 30%. Why? Because of the label that's on those sunglasses. Labels, that's one definition. The other definition of labels, what we're going to talk about, and it's, in the de- it's in the dictionary, it says this. A name given to someone, especially one, that is inaccurate or restrictive. A name given to someone that's inaccurate. Labels not only assign value and worth to things like clothes and shoes and sunglasses, but labels also try to assign value and worth to people, to our lives. Labels communicate value and worth, and even if it's a small piece of paper or a name somebody has called you, it's trying to tell you what you're worth. And many of us walk around with these labels on us. Now, some of our labels are good. I was fortunate enough to have parents and friends who always just spoke positively about me and encouraged me my whole life, and they gave me positive labels, and it helped me. But many people had not had that privilege. The other day I was talking to someone, and and they told me their dad doesn't say, I love you. He doesn't say to anybody. Their dad never told them that he loved them. Even worse, others have had parents or friends or spouses that call them hurtful names their whole lives. Things like, you're not good enough, you're a failure, you're dumb, you're ugly, and the list goes on and on and on. Or maybe you, like me, have physical attributes that got you some labels. You don't fit in, you're slow, you're clumsy, or even worse. And many of us are walking around with these labels that's trying to tell you how little you're worth, how you're unlovable, how you're a failure, how you aren't good enough. Some of the labels we have, they're going to come out in things you say like this. I'm just not a good dad. I'm not a good mom. I'm just not that smart. People just don't like me that much. I don't make friends. Those are labels that are trying to tell you your worth and their lies. All of those labels are lies. All of those labels are wrong. And there's hope this Christmas in Jesus to we can overcome these labels and become who Jesus has really called us to be. Now, before we get into our story, I want to share with you this kind of a big thought of the day. 
It'd be the big idea of the day, the main phrase we want to kind of think about the whole time. And it's this. It's the longer I carry a label, the less it describes my past and the more it determines my future. The longer I carry a label, the less it's going to describe something I did in the past, and the more it's going to determine my future. And I'm going to prove it to you, because while prepping for this message, I read someone's thesis from Marshall University on labeling students. And this thesis proves this point right here. In fact, here's what I learned. Here's just some things I learned. There's something called labeling theory, and it tells us that people define and construct their identities based upon society's label on them. AKA, people will change who they are based upon what others call them. It's crazy. In fact, they did a study, and there was this study where they told teachers, these are the students who are going to do the best in your class. The teachers thought they told them that based upon test scores, GPA, whatever it may be, but actually they told them that totally random. It was totally random. At the end of the year, they retested all the students. And the students that did the best were all students who were labeled the highest achievers. It proves that labeling affected the students' ability to learn and the expectations of the teachers, even when it's not true. The statement from the article says this, labels carry weight and affect our identities even if they aren't true. It goes on to say that too often people accept these labels without any evidence of truth. And when we accept them, we're likely to act in ways that correlate with what the labels say. Sadly, it's human nature to be emotionally affected by society's labels, even if they're not true. How does this work? Well, in real life, if you're labeled a failure, you begin to think you're a failure. And so whenever you fail, you just, that's the way I am. You stop trying things because you're a failure. In real life, say your dad left you or told you you're never going to have any friends. Your whole life, you just think you're unlovable. It's hard to get in relationships. It's hard to make things. You're willing to stay in an abusive, unhealthy relationship because you feel no one else will love you because you're unlovable. The longer we wear labels, the less it describes your past. And the more it's going to begin to determine your future. But here's the good news today. You can break free from the lies of labels. Romans 8.37 says this. Despite all these things, despite every label, despite every wrong word spoken over you, despite every lie that somebody told you, despite every hurt that you have, despite all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ Jesus who loved us. There is hope this Christmas through Christ Jesus. And today, I want to look at a story of a guy who had labels on his life. I want to look at a story who was, of a guy who was labeled something unfairly, but when he encountered Jesus, he broke those labels, those lies, off of his life. The story we're going to read is in Mark chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 1, and it says this. When Jesus returned to Capernaum, Several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. And then verse 5, just the first part of verse 5 says this, seeing their faith. Seeing their faith. Now that's very interesting to me. Jesus didn't see the faith of the paralyzed man. He didn't say seeing his faith. He said seeing their faith. Seeing the faith of the friends who carried the paralyzed man there. Seeing their faith. This is very important if you want to overcome a label. Let me tell you why. Point number one is this. The faith of the people around you matters. The faith of the people around you matters. Let me tell you a story. A couple years ago, we're getting ready to build the South Odd, that building we have in the back. A lot of work. I mean, it consumed a lot of my time. Architects, this, all these, I mean, crazy stuff. As we're getting ready to rock and roll here, COVID hits. 
Everything shut down. Remember that? Two weeks to flatten the curve. Uh, and everything shut down. It was crazy. And it was, it was wild. And what was going on at the time was no one's allowed to come to church. Uh, my mom, who was our kid's pastor, she's like, oh, yeah, it'd be great if I go part-time, you know. But I had no one to replace her, so I didn't have a replacement to use it. Um, and uh, now all of a sudden we're building this building. It's costing more and more money. And the bank's like, well, you're expanding, but no one can even come to your building. Why are you building a bigger parking lot? And I became to, like, panic and freak out. I didn't know what to do. I started to doubt. At one point, I kind of hoped as we started talks again and things progressed, I honestly, truthfully hoped the bank would just shut it down and we could drop the thing and pretend like it never happened. And so I'm struggling with this internal inside of me. And my dad, he goes, oh, let me tell you this story. My dad begins to tell me the story of how this building was built. And he tells me the story that we bought the building without any land. They actually had to put the metal frame in some vacant lot by the airport because we had no land. So we're sitting there listening, and my friend Tom Ryan, he says to me, wow, John, that's what you're doing. You're building it in faith. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that is what I'm doing, right? And he gave me the faith I needed. Why? Because the faith of the people around you matters. Your friends will either carry you toward Jesus, or they're going to pull you away from him. See, many times in life, we're not surrounded by people who are carrying us towards Jesus. The friends of the paralyzed man, they brought him to Jesus. Many times in life we're hanging around people who are pulling us away from Jesus and we can't understand why we're always doubting and always struggling because the faith of the people around you matters. Why does the faith of the people around you matter? Because faith is rarely strengthened in isolation. It almost always grows in community. Your faith is not strengthened when you're isolated. In fact, I love online church. I'm so thankful for online church. I'm excited as we grow to invest more money in better cameras and make the online experience even better to reach more people. I'm thankful we have online church so you could watch it when you're sick, watch it when you can't make it, watch it when you oversleep, watch it when you're out of town. I love it, but let me just tell you something. Online church is not the end mean because your faith cannot strengthen when you're totally isolated. But when you get here in person and you're ready to meet people and build a healthy community, that's when your faith grows. Why? Because the faith of the people around you matters. I love my mom. She, she's in this connect group, a small group. And these ladies, they just meet all year round. They don't care about the connect group schedule. They just meet every single week. And you should see what they do. They're feeding people. They're helping the community. They're baptizing people. They're praying for people. Their faith is growing. Why? Because faith is rarely strengthened in isolation. I love following all these uh, youth and uh, college students and young adults who volunteer at Forever Kids. I follow them on Instagram. And you should see the stuff they post. They post, who are your best friends? And all their best friends they serve with at church. How did you meet them? I met them at church. Why? Because faith is rarely strengthened in isolation, but it grows in community. In fact, one other thing we have that we don't talk about nearly enough Every Sunday after church, our cafe, it's to my right, your left, is open. Free coffee, free donuts, no obligation. And there's a group of people who always go and they're building community. They're strengthening their faith. Everyone is welcome. I want to let you know about our cafe. Every single Sunday, you have an easy, pressure-free way to meet people. Just grab coffee and a donut. If it's awkward, just eat your donut and go home, right? you got nothing to lose. Like Paula's donuts, free coffee, it's great. Faith. The, church, the faith of the people around you matters. Many of us are brought to faith in Jesus by people around us, right? Our parents, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers. This is why it's so important to invite people to church. What a great opportunity, Christmas, to invite people to church, to invite people to Forever Kids Christmas, to invite people to our Christmas Eve service, to invite people to watch online. Because usually we come to Christ when somebody close to us tells us about Jesus and invites us to church. Let's continue the story. The rest of verse 5 says this. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. Now, I just want to stop there for a moment because sometimes the things Jesus does seems kind of rude, right? I mean, think about what's happening. These guys came not so this guy could be forgiven, 
okay? They wanted him to be healed. They didn't care about forgiving their sins. They didn't care about being forgiven for the hole they just cut in somebody's roof, right? They wanted this guy to be healed. It seems kind of awkward, almost rude that Jesus would say that. But we have to understand the culture in Jesus' time. In that time, the Jews believed that if you were sick or paralyzed or hurt, you were actually a sinner. You had sinned. You did something wrong. In fact, the, the paralyzed man was undoubtedly labeled as a sinner or a bad person as long as he couldn't walk. Telling him, telling him that God was angry with him, that he wasn't good enough for him. The fact, the rabbis, the Jewish rabbis, this is an actual saying the rabbis had back then. This is it. It says, there is no sick man healed of his sickness until all his sins have been forgiven him. That's saying, if you are sick, you're a sinner. As long as you're sick, you're not good enough. You're not worthy. God is mad at you. That's the label this guy had. Could you imagine his whole life being labeled like that? We know today paralysis happens for a lot of reasons. You could be born that way, none of which affect your worth. Yet this guy, as long as he couldn't walk, was labeled not good enough for God. That something was wrong with him. And so Jesus, in his brilliance, he says, no, I'm not going to attack the symptoms he can't walk. I'm going to attack the source. I'm going to attack this label that's been on this guy's life, his whole life. And he says, son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus was saying, here, listen, my child, God's not angry with you. He loves you and you're worthy of his love. And the first thing that Jesus did to this man was not give him a new label. Jesus gave him a new identity. In fact, there's a difference between label and identity. Point number two is this. A label tries to describe you, but your identity in Christ defines you. A label is going to try to describe you. They're going to tell you you're tall, you're short, you're skinny, you're ugly, you're smart, you're quirky. Or they're going to try to describe your past and say that's your future. You failed, you're a failure. They left you, you're unlovable. But your identity in Christ doesn't try to describe you, what you've done, or what has been done to you. Your identity in Christ defines who you are in Jesus. Who are you in Jesus? You are a child of God. You are loved. You matter. You are important. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. You are not a mistake, but God has designed you and loved you from the moment you were conceived. You have purpose. You're alive for a reason, and God has great plans for you. That's who you are in Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has become, begun. When you come to Christ, you have new life. You're a new person. That's why we call it being born again. You're a new person. That's why we call it getting saved, because Jesus saved you from your sins, and he saved you from those labels, because you're a new person. You have a new identity. You are who Christ says you are, not what a label tries to describe you. Now let's finish the story of our friend in Mark. Remember, verse 5 said, uh, you know, your sins are forgiven. Okay, in Mark chapter 2, verse 6, the next verse, it says this. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I'll prove to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. 
I love Jesus. He's playing by the religious leader's rules, right? Remember, they said, unless you're healed, you're a sinner. And so Jesus said, all right, I'll just heal this guy, proving that I've forgiven him of his sins, because your own law says, once you're healed, God has forgiven you. And God and Jesus forgave him of his sins and removed the labels from his life. Now, what else happens to this paralyzed man who can now walk? What happens to him? We, we don't know. The Bible doesn't say. We don't know how long he lived, what he did. But there's one thing I do know. I do know now that he could walk, he no longer had a government right to beg for money and food. He had to get a job. And I bet you, wherever he went before Jesus healed him, people whispered about him. Don't you think? What, what did this guy do? What did his parents do? I wonder why he's so bad. I wonder why he can't walk. Wow, that guy will never be anything but a beggar his whole life. And I wonder what people started saying after Jesus healed him. What if they said things, how is he working? How is he walking? How could this be possible? Point number three is this. God can use your past to change someone's future. God could use your past to change someone's future. Wherever this man walked was literally an opportunity to change someone's life. Wait, you aren't crippled anymore? Wait, how can you walk? How do you have a job? Let me tell you how it happened. It happened when I met this man, Jesus. He had an opportunity for his past to change someone's future. I experienced this when I got saved in college. I was going to college, and I got saved, and I remember I was still a student, and I was going to our basic group at the time at UB, our college group, and uh, I went to the group, and as I'm walking in, I ran into an old RA I had. The RAs are kind of like the people in charge of the dorms where you live. And uh, this wasn't just any old RA. This was the RA that caught us, like, sneaking beer into the campus, and we were running, hiding, locking doors. They're calling the police on us, you know. And, man, I just felt so much shame. I was so embarrassed. I felt like I wasn't, I shouldn't be at that group. Like, oh man, she knows how bad I am. Why am I at this group? And I just felt this total shame come on me. And this RA, she walks up to me and this is what she says. She goes, wow, I can't believe what God has done in your life. I'm so happy you're here. And from that moment on, it changed my perspective on my past. My past was no longer something to be ashamed of. But it was an opportunity to show off God's forgiveness and grace in my life. From that point on, every time someone brought up my past, it was an opportunity to change their future. A couple weeks ago, as I was preparing for this message, my dad doesn't even know, but I walked in his office and I saw this flyer on his desk, so I took it. It's a flyer for uh, the Firehouse Church. It reminded me of uh, a lady who went to this church for many, many, many years. And last year, she wrote up her testimony. Her testimony was wild. She talked about being hurt, abused, experiencing death and abandonment over and over and over again by loved ones. And life had put some really awful labels on her. But thanks be to God, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ Jesus. And she was posting this because she just got ordained. And now her and her husband are pastoring the Firehouse Church to parolees, people who can't go to church. They minister to those who no one else can minister to. And God is using her past to change someone's future. But remember, the longer you carry a label, the less it describes you and the more it's going to determine your future. But it just takes one encounter with Jesus. It takes one life-changing moment with Jesus, the Son of God, to overcome labels for him to give you a new identity in Jesus. There's one more label I didn't tell you about, and it was about me. When I was a little kid, I had something, I had a speech impediment. I had a hard time saying words. 
In fact, it was so bad at times, you could ask my family, that even my own parents couldn't understand me. There's a story we always tell that my sister Emily was the only one who could really understand what Johnny was saying. Now, you combine that with me being kind of bigger than everyone, you know, sometimes bigger than my teachers, okay? I can't speak. I look like a 10-year-old. I'm five years old, and I talk like I'm a one-year-old, right? And life had some pretty rough labels they tried to give me. But what does Romans 8.37 say? Despite all these things, despite not being able to speak, despite those times my mom would walk in the grocery store and people would look at me mean because I couldn't talk, despite having to bring my birth certificate to my soccer games because I was too big, Despite these things, overwhelming victory is ours. Who would have thought this kid who can't speak has a profession of being a speaker? Because one encounter with Jesus gives you a new identity. You don't have to let your label determine your life anymore. You don't have to let your label determine your future. And our hope this Christmas isn't in a new label, isn't in a better label, isn't in a fun label. It's in a new identity that we only get in Jesus Christ. Before we sing one more song, I want to pray with you. And this is what I'm going to ask you to do. Just for a few minutes, I want to pray. And I'm going to ask that everybody here out of respect for the person next to you, even if you're not into what I'm saying, out of respect for the person next to you, I just want to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads. And I just want to begin to pray. What I want you to do, if as I was speaking, something was coming up in your life, a past hurt, a name, a label, a fear, if something kept coming up in your life, that's something God wants to touch right now and heal. For the rest of you who say, this doesn't apply to me, then I'm going to ask you to pray silently that God begins to bring healing in someone's life. And what we're going to do, it might seem a little weird, but this is totally normal. We're just going to pray. We're eventually going to be rebuke it. This is what you do in counseling. I've done this many times. It's a great way to overcome labels and invite Jesus into your life to bring healing. And so I'm going to pray, and at one point during my prayer, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to ask you to repeat this, kind of say a similar prayer, replacing whatever I say with your label. But before we pray, I just want to ask, who right now would say, that's me, I need to overcome the label? All you have to do is slip your hand up in the air, hands everywhere. Yep, keep putting them up, put them up, put it down once you put it up. Wow, hands everywhere. We're going to pray, okay? I want to pray for you. If you're not involved, just pray to yourself, encouraging that God brings healing to people. Lord, I thank you right now that despite all of these things, despite how that person hurt you, despite how they left you, despite what they've called you, despite what you've done, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours. And anyone who belongs to Christ, anyone who believes in Jesus has become a new person. And so Lord, today, I ask you come into our hearts right now. I just pray you begin to break these lies of these labels in people's lives. Just begin to break them off of people's lives right now. We thank you that we are children of God. We are not a mistake. We are loved. We have purpose and you have good plans for us. I thank you you've given each of us talents, each of us abilities, each of us made us uniquely and you've loved us the whole time. We thank you that we are not rejected. You are not rejected. You are loved and you are wanted. You were never a mistake. God knew it the whole time. And today it's time to believe the truth, not these lies that's you right now, I'm just going to ask you to say something kind of quietly to yourself. Just say, I rebuke this, and you say it, I rebuke this label, I rebuke this lie. Just say, kind of pray, Lord, I rebuke the lie that I'm not good enough. I rebuke the lie that I'm a failure. I rebuke the lie that I'm unlovable. I rebuke the lie that I'm ugly. Lord, I just, we just rebuke the lies right now, and we thank you for the identity we have in Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. And Lord, I just pray, Holy Spirit, just come and just, and just bring healing 
in people's hearts right now. Lord, anything you've brought to the surface, Lord, I just ask you to bring healing and health and wholeness. In Jesus' name.